Uh, um, I've got this microphone for you to hear, and FCAT has also got this fancy new microphone as well, and this is recording right into my pocket digitally, and then somehow FCAT syncs this with that picture um, so that the sound quality should be much, much better. Uh, so, I've got my fingers crossed, but I have no idea what's going on with this, uh, this digital recording. Uh, so, hopefully, it all works out well. Uh, but that, that's for the tech people to figure out how to get those two together. Also, if anybody uh, would like to go to uh, Reverend um, David Jones's installation today, you don't want to drive all the way up to Asheville, I'm coming right by here later on today to go to that service. It's at 3 o'clock. And from here, it's about a half hour's drive, so um, maybe a little bit after two. If anybody would like to go, uh, please let me know. I'll be glad to pick you up right here, and off we can go to uh, Asheville together for that. So with all of that said, let me say welcome to the First Congregational Church of Sunderland. We are officially an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, which means that we welcome members, friends, family, guests, seekers, whoever you are, whatever you look like, wherever you're from, you are welcome here. We welcome believers solid in their faith. We welcome those who are still searching, maybe looking for faith. So whoever you are, and wherever you are in your own life's journey, hopefully you know by now, you are welcome here at this church. And with that said, let me invite Eileen to come forward for our announcements.
same thing that was beautiful. Um, before we hit our opening hymn and candle lighting, um, because this is introduction to the service, this is probably a perfect time to bring up these postcards again. If you haven't got any of these, we have them available. And what we're asking you to do is we're having an open house and we are extending an invitation to others uh, who may not go to church anywhere at present. Uh, may be interested in looking around, and, and if you have a neighbor, a friend, a family member that may be in that situation and may be open to an invitation, uh, you can either put a stamp on this and mail it to them, you can hand it to them, or you can even just uh, send a, um, an electronic one through your social media, post it on Facebook or Instagram, or whatever you like to do. Uh, but this is October 16th, and uh, it only will work if we take it seriously and share the invitation. So as we think about entering into this service, let us think about inviting others to enter into the service as well. And we do have these if you would be interested. So with that said, our opening hymn, I invite you to please stand if you are able. Red hymnal number 21, we gather together. protection and rescue when life is its hardest. Worship God who richly provides us with all things needed. Give thanks to the one who dwells among us in the spirit. The creator of heaven and earth keeps faith forever. We will pour out our thankfulness in words and deeds. And now coming together is this worshiping congregation, whether here in person, FCAT, or on Zoom, however you have chosen to join us, our unison prayer. Ever present God, let your spirit fill this gathering, for we need to know that you are near, that you hold us in your embrace, that you will never leave or forget us. There is much in this world that is unfair and hurtful. Let us know of your power and trust in your protection, believing in the promise of our faith that this life is but a moment, because we are not for eternity. Help us to see your higher purpose and to live accordingly. Grant to us such confidence that we may look beyond ourselves, become a blessing to others, 
not looking away when others are in need, but looking for ways to make a difference. Amen. Now let's share in the singing of the glory of God. So, I'm sure you've all seen at one time or another that truth test that people will do. And we used to go to all these youth retreats, and in every youth retreat, they always do these truth tests. For, well, not truth, uh, that's a 40, it's a trust test. I'm sorry, trust test. And that's where you know, you're standing like this, and you've got people behind you, and as you fall back, they're supposed to catch you. You all know that one, right? You've seen that? So, with that trust test, I don't care how many times I've done it, you're supposed to put your hands at your side and not look back, and you're supposed to just trust that they're going to catch you. And even though, you know, these may be friends yours, maybe if you're a kid in school, you're doing, you got a teacher, you know, when you're doing that, you got to be a lot more trustful than I am, because when I do it, as I go like this, I can't keep my hands to my side. I, I automatically, I start going like this, and it's really hard. I don't know if I've ever done it where I've actually trusted enough to actually fall back without having some kind of a reflex. Because I think deep down inside of us, maybe nature has put that, that message there that it's hard to trust. And, you know, 
I think with all of the, uh, you know, the genetics that we've inherited from just, you know, going through this, this progress from, you know, having to, you know, survival of the fittest, that it's hard to trust. And so when you're like this and you're falling back, it is really hard not to have some kind of reflex that says, don't trust. So what God and religion and faith are trying to do, they're trying to make us more than just our natural selves. They're trying to make us into something better than our natural selves. And the reading that I read just shared with us, some good job with those names, by the way, Harry, good job. Um, when you got those, uh, that kind of trust, you gotta think about the story of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, he's got a tough job. It, you know, if you ever really want an exciting book in the Bible to read, open up Jeremiah. It is one of the most self-revelatory readings in the Bible. A lot of the Bible, we don't even know who the, the authors are, but Jeremiah bears his soul. Um, he, he's really, uh, he, he's got a tough job. He has to tell his friends, his neighbors, his countrymen that things are not going to go well. Uh, we're going to lose everything. Uh, your property, your house, maybe your lives, your family, they were going to be, you know, deported to another land. Things are not going to be good. And he knows this. And that's why he's in jail. He's in the court. He's under guard. And the king says, why do you keep saying these things in the name of the Lord that we're going to be destroyed? And Jeremiah says, hey, that's what God said. So it's not an easy job. And so then he comes up with this, this trust test. And his cousin comes up to him and says, I want you to buy this piece of property. Now, this is basically that same line as, I got a, a bridge in Brooklyn, you want to buy it. Why in the world, if you really believe, and Jeremiah really believes that everything is going to come to destruction, his cousin comes up and says, well, buy a piece of property. There's going to be no property in a little bit. No property at all. And so he says, buy this property. And Jeremiah, with that trust test, he says, okay, I'm going to buy that piece of property from you. I'm going to write out all the deed with all the legal you know, significance, witnesses, signs, seal. I'm going to put it in a stone jar. We're going to hide that stone jar so that it survives this time apart so that when we come back, this property will be mine. That's a message of trust. That as bad as things are, things are going to get really, really bad. People are going to die. The nation is going to be defeated. We're all going to go into exile. It's going to get really bad. But there's that message of trust that God will be there on the other side. That God, even though you leave this holy land, God will not leave you. And that God will bring us back. There's trust. And it's hard to trust like that. Just like it's hard to fall back. Um, but God is asking us to, to rise above our natural instincts. Uh, to not just be an animal, but to be made in the image and likeness of God. We have to trust in God. I hope church, I hope Sunday school, I hope the Bible class, I hope whatever you do, prayer, however you do it, I hope that helps us to rise up to be better people, and better people of faith. And a lot of that has to do with trusting in God. So there's been a change in our bulletin. And I, I thought it was so sweet. Anthony comes over to me and he says, I need thee every hour. I said, oh, Anthony, that's so exciting. I need thee every hour. And then he says, no, no, that's not you. It's the next hymn. So our next hymn change in the, uh, the bulletin is I need thee every hour. <laughs>
Thank you, choir. Very nice to have that message added to our service today. It's now time for our invitation to prayer. So let us begin. Um, I'd like to offer prayers for the people of Ukraine. It, uh, it's getting a little bit more scary. If that's, um, it's hard to imagine, but it's true. Uh, this past week, the president of Russia, Mr. Putin, uh, he's actually broached the possibility of nuclear weapons being used on the battlefield. Once you cross that Rubicon, I don't know what that means. Uh, so let's pray for the people of Ukraine. Let's pray for saner minds to uh, take hold. Let's pray for peace, you know, in all these war-torn and violent areas in our world. Uh, there's got to be a better way. Um, and the, the, the absurdity, the insanity of trying to use a nuclear weapon uh, on your own border, I just, I don't understand uh, how some of these minds work. Uh, so let's pray that God may intervene in some subtle way uh, to, to let some kind of wisdom sink in, where right now it's just passion. We also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. And we pray for all those who are affected by COVID-19, literally the hundreds of millions who've been infected and those who have died. And we pray for continuing progress against this disease. And we wish for our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith, uh, a joyous Rosh Hashanah, which is tomorrow. Um, that's the Jewish New Year's, and that is the beginning of their high holy days. And we should always remember that um, the Jews and the Christians, we are really, we're, we're family. Uh, Jesus would have celebrated Rosh Hashanah with his family up in Nazareth. He would have celebrated Rosh Hashanah with his disciples. Jesus was Jewish. And Rosh Hashanah honors God today uh, just as much as when Jesus celebrated it 2,000 years ago. Too. So to all of our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith, tomorrow, a happy new year, a blessed Rosh Hashanah. Also, a uh, very young gentleman from our neighborhood here just across the river uh, passed away in a motorcycle accident up in New Hampshire, Kevin Camosa, I believe he was only 41, and uh, he died last weekend in an accident, so we pray um, for his eternal rest, and we also pray for his family, um, especially for his two young children, Courtney and Calvin. Uh, that's got to be almost an unbearable burden to have to bear. Um, at that age and for that whole family that's grieving. So we pray for the family of Kevin Mosin and of course also for Kevin himself. So are there any other prayers um, that you'd like to share at this time in the congregation here? Anybody, on, at home? anybody on Zoom have prayer requests? Just shout them out. So nope. hearing nothing, okay. Let us just turn inward for just a few moments of silence in the middle of our public worship. Uh, to say to God those things that are better um, left a little bit silent and not said out loud. So just a few moments of silence. Eternal God, whose will for all of humankind is that we live within your rule of love, call us out of our preoccupation with riches to sense our common plight with all others who are near and far, whatever they may look like, whatever they may believe, wherever they come from, especially those unable to help themselves and those who suffer for no reason of their own, such as those people in Ukraine who are torn apart by war, Don mentioned our crop hunger walk. There are people in so many lands and regions that simply, no matter how hard they try, simply have a hard time putting food on the table. So for all of these people, Lord, we keep them in our thoughts and our prayers. Life is often unfair. The world can be a dangerous and a mean place. When others face tragedy and poverty, war and disease, inspire us to show compassion to them. Help us to make all life better. And in this way, may we ready ourselves for eternal life with you in heaven. We ask you also to hear our prayers, the needs and the hopes that only you can answer, and that we be attentive enough in our faith to recognize your answers to them. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And at this time, may we share the prayer that Jesus has given to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So let us pray for Alan, Alan Alice, Alice, Art, Art Barbara, Barbara, Bill, Bill Bonnie, Carrie, Carrie, Cheryl, Cindy, Denise, Doug, Evelyn, Frank, Frank Jeff, Jeff, Jimmy, John, John, June, Kathy, Kathy Lisa, Martha, Mary, Mary and Joe, Alyssa, Michelle, Ruben Hart, Cheryl, Steve, Thelma, Vinny, Vivian, and Ron, Wes, Wink, victims of violence everywhere in the world those affected by natural disasters around the globe, and we pray for peace on earth. Yesterday we had a chicken barbecue in, um, in Hatfield. I think I'm a little bit more tired than I realized, so I apologize for that little mix-up. It's now time for our gospel reading, and it's from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 30. I'm sorry, no, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And Jesus' parable says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every single day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table, and even dogs would come and lick his sores. And the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And in Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And sent Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all of this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. They said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. And he said, No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them, someone from the dead, then they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and to the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be accepted to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. i got to borrow Anthony's piano for just a second for this. The other day, I'm up in my home office uh, working on church stuff, and downstairs there's a piano tuner working on his stuff. So as I'm upstairs trying to concentrate, I keep hearing, <laughs> and he does that over and over and over again. And okay, that's one, and then, and he does that, there's 88 keys on this piano. And every time it's just like that, it's boring, it's monotonous, it's annoying, it's distracting. I'm trying to do church stuff, and that one single note all by itself hit over and over and over again. You just want to bang your head just like they were banging that note. And I love, I absolutely love the piano. You know, I took lessons as a kid. I was terrible. There was no hope of ever getting better. Sometimes you just got to be honest and realize, no, no matter how much time and effort I put into this, I am not going to get better. So without that chance of getting better, I really have a lot of appreciation for the ones who can really play that piano. And I, I say the word play. I, I think I told you over the summer, Sharon and I were lucky enough to went off to uh, Worcester to, uh, to hear Richard Marsalis in the concert out there. We ran into him by accident. And, and the way he said, you know, the man could play. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, I don't mean just, you know, like a, sorry, Anthony, but I don't mean like a kid's, you know, piano recital. I mean play, you know, like when Anthony plays. I, that, that's what I mean by play. You know, Sharon took me to see um, uh, Elton, not Elton John, Billy Joel. Went off to Fenway. And we watched Billy Joel, and I'm not a huge Billy Joel fan, but I really enjoyed watching everybody else at Fenway. They were having so much fun watching Billy Joel and listening to him with the piano man. He can play. 
And Sharon is still upset after all these years because we didn't find out enough time to get tickets over at the Mullen Center. Maybe you remember there was a time when Billy Joel and Elton John played together right in the Amherst and we didn't get tickets. But boy, those guys, they can play. And you know, next year, the 150th anniversary of Sergei Rachmaninoff's 150th birthday anniversary. And his music is going to be everywhere. And you, all you have to do, you can go to YouTube and put in Sergei Rachmaninoff. And good luck if you can spell that. But Sergei Rachmaninoff in his like second piano concerto. It's like possessed. I mean, he's all over the piano from the lowest notes to the highest notes. And you know, if you, if you get a chance and you're on that YouTube and listen to it, then go to Google and just ask them to put up like a couple of lines of the score. There's black notes everywhere. And I mean, they're, 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 there's like, they're like this high. It's like every finger has to be on exactly a certain note and exactly at the same time and exactly the same way. And it says vivace, you know, lightly and with it, like almost like, like, like exercising without, you know, without sweating. You're supposed to do all these athletic things with your fingers and your arms moving all over. Your feet are on, this, on the pedals and it's supposed to be just light and fair, you know, no problem at all. Anybody can do this and nobody can do this stuff. But you know, the message is when you hit that one note, like my piano tuner, it's annoying. It just it drives you nuts. That one note alone. When you take all of those notes, you put them together, like say Rachmaninoff and a second piano concerto, all of a sudden that annoying single alone note just repeated at one time after another, all of a sudden it becomes magic, it becomes beautiful, it becomes transformative. And so that's what I'm trying to get across, that message of alone. We're not really all we can be, but put us all together and magic can happen. And one of the mo mo movements of Rachmaninoff's second, I'm sorry, second piano concerto is such a beautiful melody that even current day um, composers have taken that and created other pieces. Maybe you've heard of this all by myself, don't want to be all by myself anymore. That song is from Rachmaninoff. And so it's not classical anymore, it's popular, but it's that same beautiful melody, all those notes coming together. And he, he felt like something inside of him, you know, just that it was that, I don't want to be all by myself anymore. And something about Rachmaninoff's music kind of said, I don't want to be by myself. I want, I want to have something else, in, someone else in my life. And it's that same message about like that piano tune, that isolated note can turn into Rachmaninoff, can turn into all by myself, don't want to be all by myself anymore. That's the same message that Jesus is sharing with us in today's gospel. And it's that powerful message that sometimes we can overlook because most of Jesus' stories in this world is it's told in the next world. But I really think the message is all about here and now. The rich man's isolation, his concentration on only his own pleasure, only his own needs, I mean, to the complete disregard of everyone around him. You know, Lazarus. Think about this, that the rich man, in our world, you all know the names of the rich men. You know, Musk and, you know, Steve Jobs was another one, and, you know, Bill Gates and all these guys. You know, we know the names of the rich guys. We don't know the names of the guy who is sitting in Northampton right now you know, with a little sign right by him on, you know, the street corner saying, you know, you have to change one. We don't know that guy's name. Think about Jesus. Jesus doesn't name, name the rich guy. He has no idea who the rich guy is. He knows Lazarus. You know that famous line of Jesus, the first shall be last and the last shall be first? This is it. Jesus knows Lazarus's name. He shares Lazarus's name. The rich man? I don't know who he is. So Jesus is concerned about Lazarus. And so in that isolation, the rich man, he can have the beautiful, most beautiful house, he has the most sumptuous meals, but he is that one note just being played over and over and over again. It's annoying, it's grating, but the other thing is, he really he impoverishes himself by making himself more wealthy. One note on that piano, that doesn't do any honor or glory to the piano. No one's going to pay a lot of money to go sit in a, in a theater somewhere, a concert hall, and hear somebody go like this. <laughs> it only becomes beautiful when all those keys are played together. So for as much as that rich guy, who we don't know, Jesus, I don't know who he is, and for as much as we think about you know, the rich guy and think, oh, look how lucky he is, he has all that stuff, Jesus is saying, he's as exciting 
is that one note being pounded over and over and over again. Who is beautiful? He says, well, let's wait until we get to that message after we tell the other part of Jesus' story. Because Jesus' story leaves here and then goes up into heaven. And I don't think that this parable has anything to do with heaven and hell. And the reason I don't think this has anything to do with heaven and hell is think about how silly this would be if it did. What is the rich man's sin in this world? The rich man's sin is that he ignored Lazarus and everybody liked Lazarus. And that's for a lifetime. So that's measured in decades. So the rich man ignores Lazarus. That is his sin that sends him to eternal Hades. Lazarus is, you know, has nothing here, goes off up into heaven, and he enjoys heaven. Now, what is heaven supposed to be like? He's up there, Lazarus is up there in heaven, the unknown rich guy is down in hell, and somehow <laughs> you can yell from heaven to hell and back and forth. There's a chasm there. And so Jesus is telling the story that down there, there's a guy who's in torment, there's Lazarus up there. Remember, this guy is here because he didn't care about anybody else for a lifetime, measured in decades. And then up in heaven, you got all the saints living with God. And think about what heaven is. Uh, this is day 1,799,000. I think I'll take a walk over to the edge of heaven. I'll look down. <laughs> look at all those people down there. Boy, they look miserable. They are burning in a lot of flames down there, aren't they? How can the saints in heaven enjoy eternal blessedness when they ignore the fate of the ones in hell? How can a God who goes on the cross and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, Forgive them, and then Jesus is sitting there, you know, hanging out with the saints, saying, yeah, look at them, boy, they look pretty miserable down there. How can Jesus, how can we as saints, how can we imagine that the, that the edge of heaven, hearing the screams and the torments of hell, we don't care? It, it, should, it makes no sense, because why is the rich man down there? Because he didn't care for a period of a lifetime, decades. And now you're saying the saints in heaven forever and ever in eternity? They don't care? It makes no sense if this is a story about supernatural geography. It only makes sense if this is Jesus saying, you've got a certain amount of time here. We're not going to live forever. We are going to die at some point. We are mortal beings. And I don't care how lucky you are. There, a woman we just prayed for in Hatfield is 104 and just went on hospice. I don't know if she's going to make 105, but you can live to be 104 years old. It's a long time. It's a drop in eternity. And so we are going to be here for a certain amount of time. Jesus says, be aware of that and realize we're all in this together. This is our gift. We're all in this together. Like I was saying with that, the, you know, the story about trust. You know, we have to trust in one another. Uh, we have to be able to trust in each other to help carry the load. We're not going to be able to do this alone. Think about Jeremiah's story. Every month, all destruction is coming, but I'm going to buy this piece of property because God is going to bring us back. There's hope. So we're all in this together here on this little blue dot of a planet. And God and Jesus' parable is saying, act like that. Act like we're all in this together. Care for one another. If you look past the other person, you're not only hurting them, you become this. You hurt yourself. You may have all kinds of stuff, but Jesus says, who cares about the stuff? At some point, the stuff means nothing. What is your life adding up to? What have you left as a memory? Do, do people care? Or are they going to say, boy, he had a lot of stuff? And so there's that message. We impoverish the others and we impoverish ourselves when we're nothing but one note in one time after another after another. We have a chance to make beautiful music if we are together, says Jesus. And I think that's Jesus all the time. I really cannot imagine Jesus ever really expecting that people are burning in eternal hell and Jesus says, well, I'll see you guys later. That's not Jesus. It just doesn't make any sense. So we're not out trying to preach a message of always judgment. I hear that so much. And you know, it actually makes me smile and I laugh. I see these little clips on television that over in Iran, the morality police, some little guy in his little scooter got off of his little scooter in Iran and he slapped the woman because something like a little streak of hair or something was out of her veil. And all these women and these men, because they're fed up because they just, these morality police just killed a 
21 or 22 year old girl over there because maybe her ankle was showing or something like that. So the morality, this guy got back on his little scooter. He's ready to take off after hitting a girl, big brave guy. They pounced on this guy and it was like cathartic. They're just fed up with this kind of a judgmental God that says it's either this way or I'm gonna you know, throw you into hell forever. That doesn't help anybody. And it makes religion look bad. It makes the world a mean place even meaner because of what we do. So Jesus says, you only got this amount of time. Take care of one another. Look at one another. Make beautiful music together. Don't be the idiot who only is concerned about the one note. You throw your life away, and you make everyone else miserable as well. So in Jesus' name, then we listen to that beautiful parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and not think about it as up there, but think about what it means for right here and for right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn of closing is Blue Hymn number 348, Softly and Tenderly.
Face life with gentleness, but also endurance. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life that lives right now in the midst of the everyday. Good works and caring contain their own blessings. Our lives dance with meaning when we share with others as we are able to. We rejoice in Jesus' healing touch. We give thanks for earthly blessings and for salvation so richly given by God. May we now go forth to love and serve the Lord among everyone whom we may meet.